it's an addiction it is an addiction there's no doubt about that right like chasing the dream is an addiction whatever whatever field you're in um, hey everybody welcome to for the record a casual mostly unedited conversation series presented by gray matter where we talk to music heads about their stories and the music that makes them I'm your host, McKeegan Voice. Today, on episode 42, I chatted with Jamie Reddington, who uses the artist moniker Sound of Fractures. The North London native is a DJ and producer who infuses his love of films, stories, and human experiences into his music, borrowing from UK dance music, hip hop, and soul. His musical ethos is oriented around the concept of finding beauty and imperfection, and he embraces new technology to help share it, which includes selling non-fungible token or NFT collections and co-founding the collective Wild Awake, a music project focused on building scenes that uses Web3 technology. We chatted about his new connective album called Scenes, about what it was like to grow up in a musical household, and of course, we explored a lot of great music. Hope you enjoy. All right. Hey, Jamie, it's great to have you here. Hey, man, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, so this is the first time that I think we've ever had anyone on For the Record who who is uh, my neighbor. <laughs> uh, me and Jamie meet up probably on like a monthly basis or so for coffee at a place in between our, you know, our respective homes, which is... Finally which found is, someone is, close to home. Indeed, which has been lovely. Um, and now here we are uh, on For the Record. And um, yeah, to begin, as, as we always do with this, we start, start at the beginning. So I'd love to hear um, if, if you could dive into uh, your, your childhood, your origins, your connections with music, and you know, when your relationship with music first began. Big questions. Um, I did like instrument lessons as a kid. You know, I didn't love it. I was never like amazing at playing, but I um, I found my way through it by like memorizing music. I never really learned to sight read, but I kind of did things like recorder and then saxophone, and then went to secondary school. And some friends of friends were in a band and. There wasn't a bass player or they would fallen out with the bass player or something um and i went home was like i need a bass guitar hmm. i want to be in, i want to be in a band so i got a bass guitar <laughs> and i joined the band and i worked it out you know like i we did the first rehearsals with no understanding of how to play a bass guitar mm -hmm. and and just worked it out and I, I think looking back now that's kind of what i've always done and and that slowly you know progressed into sort of making you know, me and my friend in the band, you know, when the band started to dissolve, we started recording stuff on four tracks and using drum machines. And his older brother was a drum and bass producer um, called Sam Calm. And, and we used to sit in his room, play FIFA, and he would be like making beats on an Atari and an S3000. Their house was full of records. My house was full of records because my parents, you know, worked in um, music. And it just turned into a love you know as i discovered hip-hop and different music i just started to find myself enjoying like mashing up things together and putting things together in in a way that you know when i was in a band my mates always used to say that what i was playing wasn't a bass line <laughs> because mm. i was i was just doing other stuff you know like i was playing around and playing melodies and i guess as i got into using computers and samplers I really started to find my feet as like a way to um as a way to create in in, in a, on my own terms i guess rather than kind of trying to fit into someone else's box mm -hmm. um and that was kind of how it all started for me being being um being a beat maker you know like me and my friend put out music we sold our own vinyl um and we were part of like a scene in london you know like a uk hip-hop scene i guess before there was really like anything around there's only a few things but definitely not in the mainstream um yeah and through that we got pulled into kind of like commercial music we got like some writing sessions and then i got the next kind of phase of my life was getting sucked up into that commercial music um system cool 
Yeah, and and if memory serves, your parents, um, I think, advised you not to work in the music industry, not to go into music, based on their respective experiences, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, like obviously, learned. I learned never to say to my children, "Don't work in music, whatever you do, because it's full of, <laughs> you know, it's terrible industry. It's not it's not reliable. It's full of awful people." And that's basically <laughs> like what I heard growing up, um, mm. well, alongside like loads of amazing things, right? Like my. My dad was a radio plugger. It didn't really have any relevance to me in terms of like making stuff happen for me. Um, but it definitely gave me like a like an unspoken language thing that I didn't really realize till later on. Like understand the language of the industry and how things work was quite natural to me. Um, having kind of been in and around it and mainly through him telling me, you know, about things going wrong or like <laughs> things not working or, you know, he, you know as later in your career in music right you're, you're you're unwanted if you don't start your own company um or be an md then there's, there's no place there's no place for you in the industry it's almost like i was thinking about the other day it's almost like being a footballer you know like mm. post 30 and definitely post 40 50 60 there's unless you're like a manager or running your own company you know running your own press company or whatever um there isn't really a place for you and my mum quit when I was two to look after me um so you know my memory of her is not working in music but obviously there's all these kind of like artifacts of this of this life she had before she had me basically hmm. Hmm. I'm curious uh you know for instance like when I was growing up my parents you know were we're both elementary school teachers. So um, it was kind of a similar conversation where like, you know, around the dinner table, they would be talking about all the terrible things, you know, about education and how it's underfunded and how there aren't enough resources and things like that. And that would always be followed by don't get into education, don't become a teacher, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, I'm curious if, if, if that existed around your, you know, your dinner table growing up. And I'm also curious if like what, what your parents were talking about if that's still applicable to what you see in the industry because i know you know like our relationship mine and yours you know kind of started you know around these issues and you know wanting to bring care back into the music industry and you know, talking about community and like new internet spaces and things like that so i'm curious you know if you if these these issues that your parents you know felt strongly about to you know to discourage you from entering the music industry i'm curious if they persist in your view I, you know i i'm trying to remember now but i don't i remember the sort of i remember my dad um berating people um <laughs> i won't use the words but you know um <laughs> just you know like the feeling of betrayal or you know like um being <sighs> being you know um i don't know uh undervalued you know like work you know working for somewhere for years and then them spitting you out right with as if you know you were never there and that's the same in loads of industries i think like music often feels really hard because you have this like a deep emotional connection that you know like that, that is the reason you got into it you know why else would you do it because it's so hard and that adds this extra like emotional heartstring and also like what I'm going through now of like, you know, later in life, like finding your place. Right. And if, if you work on the industry side, people always, um, you know, like people are always so quick to be like A&R people of the devil. Right. Or like front record labels and all those things. But, you know, in reality, they're just people who love music trying to earn a living next to the thing that they love. Right? They don't get to choose what they work on most of the time. Most of the time, they're just trying to stay, keep their job, you know, like whatever they need to do to keep their job. And I think I had this weird sort of mix of, you know, part of me, my dad wasn't around that much, right? Like when I was really young, because he worked in the music industry. He was very, like, he was a great dad. He was present, but like in the evenings, in the weeks, right? He wouldn't get back home till sort of just before I went to sleep or after I went to sleep. Mm -hmm. because he that's the nature of the industry right and um i was very lucky that my you know 
my mum's storytelling of it was that just I couldn't be there for you in the way that I wanted to be working in that industry. So I had to leave. Um, and, I, you know, people always just make jokes like, oh, your mum would be doing this if she hadn't have left and blah, blah, blah. But her, her take is always just like it, staying just wasn't an option. Hmm. I missed too much. I didn't want to miss anything. So it wasn't even like, I don't know if that's entirely true, but, you know, that's right. definitely what she, decision she made so i was aware of those i got became aware of those things as i got older but really as a teenager it's more just like in passing comments about like don't fucking work in the music industry you don't want to work in the music industry like because i was getting into a band and you know we were like trying to get signed and from mm-hmm. quite early you know i was we were really close to doing things i had a friend who's you know someone else who's you know was in and around music a lot um and we were you know in sessions as teenagers as, as a band and then trying to get cuts in our early 20s late teens with with labels and it came very quickly to us to be like integrated into that world and we caught the end of like the 90s um boom it was actually like early 2000s mid 2000s but you know like our first major cuts whether they came out or not we got big session fees and we worked in like big studios so we got like a bit of the end of the glamour so like at that mm. age just like anyone else right like I remember saying shit like I, you know I'm not going to go on holiday until I've had a, um, a number one record hmm. and and you know it's something as we talk about quite a lot it's quite interesting to me right like you push away relationships you, you know you lose contact with your friends because they don't get you they don't get it Mm, you don't get just... don't get people like us you know like we're just like we have this different thing you know like and then you get into your like 30s and your mate who quit running hip-hop nights is working at a tech startup going to barbados and skiing and owns three houses and switches off at five o'clock and is really <laughs> happy and you're like this this doesn't this isn't planning out quite like how i imagined it right <laughs> um so yeah i mean i i find that stuff really interesting i, I think that my parents story has rubbed off on me a lot more as I've got older because you know like when I had my first kid I was like well my mum gave this all up to be present and I can really see how hard it is to be present mm-hmm. especially now with so- they didn't even have social media right yeah like it's a totally different world for us yeah I mean so when you had that you know that realization that <laughs> this is you know this is really fucking difficult and you know there isn't all that much glamour in in it you know from a day-to-day perspective and you see other people who are working in in more traditional industries working more traditional nine-to-fives have more more reliable paychecks and are able to live you know go to Barbados Mm -hmm. you know things like that I guess how did that change your approach to your music and and how do you you know how do you think about balance in your life now oh that's like a constant evolving journey for me at the moment I think one of the things that is you know I've started working in in university you know lecturing and it's been very hard for me to work in that like infrastructure which is essentially like a corporate infrastructure you don't see it that way from the outside but when you get in you you have a line manager and you have like these systems and like these stuff that you have to do and the ways you have to do it and not an admin that's been like a really big battle for me i think it strengthened my belief that um you know like i create i spent a long time creating a world that i fitted into for myself you know like uh, uh, the hours that i worked the things that i did in the day and the outputs change you know like i did music for films i did music for pop records i did music for underground music and um but but the but the working system kind of always stayed the same which was like me in a room on a computer creating stuff all day every day seven days a week Mm -hmm. and i think now i'm getting to the point where i'm seeing people who have the same kind of like creative autonomy and like lifestyle flexibility i don't know what you call it in different industries and i think i think i felt that was like unique to music you know like i can't the way that I am, this is the only thing that I can do, right? Like, mm-hmm. this is the only thing I can, this is the only way that I can be be good at a thing. Because the other option to you in your head as, as an egotistical creative um, 
and you are we i think we all are you know i think that now um is that that other thing is just like working in mcdonald's or sitting in front of a computer tapping in digits into a spreadsheet with a horrible boss in a gray room with a hundred other people being like a drone right mm -hmm. which obviously having any job to some people is amazing um we're like privileged enough to think that to think that way but also i'm quite you know I try to maintain that ambition to push myself to be like, yeah, you can, you know, I'm watching people working on different countries, traveling and, you know, like living different lifestyles, balancing different jobs and different outputs. And um, so I was still, I was still kind of exploring that. I think the thing that underpins it all is the kind of, when you get down to it, it's time. <laughs> Whether that's time to do things with your friends, time to do things with your family, time to do nothing, time to do the things that you care about, I, I've become quite interested in, you know, time as a concept. I, I work at a university with a really um, amazing, um, I, I guess maybe she's like a mentor, <laughs> um, called Sally Ann Gross, who has been like a, a kind of constant in my life. Um, so like one of the first, if not the first female A&R person and done loads of amazing things. And she always used to talk to me about this thing about like mention time. Time is really interesting. Time's at the heart of everything especially for people who see themselves as being creative. Hmm. You know, how much time do you have to do the thing that you love? What do you get back from it? And I think that is something I'm trying to think of, about a lot, you know, also slow down with music, right? If that allows me time to live and do other things because it was amazing and exciting and I wanted to do it and it was my dream and it still is many people's dreams. But actually when you look back on 15 years of seven days a week in a studio, um in the moment you're like this is the dream i'm creating amazing shit right but like when you look back you're like whoa what you know like i did for me anyway i did just sit in a box for 15 hmm. years i went to america i did like cool stuff right like but <laughs> went on tour but i mean i definitely had this moment of like reframing hmm. to get the most out of what comes next right not not because to like diminish that because that is you know an amazing job to have to do music every day mm -hmm. um but it's also okay for it not to be enjoyable right like to allow myself to be like question is this actually am i happy or am i just mm -hmm. doing this thing that i program myself to think is like the thing that i do mm. um yeah they, these are the questions that you know you start asking yourself yeah i mean it's really difficult balance i mean you know time you come to realize is is really the the only currency that doesn't really change i mean it fluctuates time is relative like everything else but like yeah. time is the thing that is just there that we constantly have to balance that we constantly you know have to account for and think about you know how do we find balance what do we it's need it's the unspoken privilege right you know like I got into something about this week with someone who wrote, you know, was writing about Fred again. Um, and everything they were saying was true. And it is really interesting and it is really inspiring. And it does all come from him because I know people who know him very well. And he is very genuine and all that stuff, you know, is very real to him. But but time is a factor, right? Like not having to ever have a job, yeah. not having to work for rent to have a, a supportive team of people, you know, like access to money to build things, to put on pop-ups, to help edit, to take the pressure off, you know, to, to allow, those are, those are like the unspoken things. It's very easy, especially in today's social media environment to be like, here's the top 10 things you should be doing. Yeah. Right. Like, and they're very, you know, they're these kind of like take posts, which, you know, like suck you in, which is like create a community, you know, put your story online, uh connect with your fans do them do like really personal things for your fans that's how fred did it they're not easy things to do yeah. right they're, they're quite complex things to do that take up lots of time e dming all your fans every day mm -hmm. even if you have 10 is more time than people have free to make music after work let alone to do as well as make music and run yeah. spotify ads and yeah. live breathe for a minute and read a book or watch a tv series or you know like fall in love right like mm. um yeah. but I, you know 
there's a new maybe there's a the different there's a different balance. I just think maybe there's a there's a there's a balance that we presented as the only way. I think that's something that me and you've you know, talked about a lot. What do you know? What is a what's a healthy balance? You asked me, I think, at the beginning, like <laughs> what's balance? I'm not sure, but I think my hindsight thing to end it is just patience with myself. Hmm. Allowing my, you know, like allowing things to go on for longer, allowing time, allowing time for things to work. And the benefits of that are that you have you have other things in your life that make your output better and more real and more satisfying to you and more and more of a um, cathartic process, which is what music starts out for us all of us. Right. Like and most of us in a room with our mates feeling great. Right? Mm-hmm. The world disappearing. <laughs> And it should still be right. It shouldn't just stop being there. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, you know, I think that's a really important point in, you know, talking about Fred again and, and you're talking about, or, you know, at least, you know, allowing the space for us to acknowledge that a lot of the artists that we know, whose names we know, grew up with, you know, pretty privileged backgrounds that gave them the time and the space to like spend their time making art and building community um you know i've got a friend who's a filmmaker and and you know like all of you know the people within kind of you know his outer orbit are are people who grew up with a ton of privilege who get to spend their time making film and and that's why they make film and that's why people see their films and and i mean biggest investors in the creative industries are parents and middle class parents right and and i'm that's me too right like i had a place to live and a room in my house because i put my studio until i was like 21 and when i was like in my late 20s and i had a gap between publishing deals i could i went back home right there was room for me there was a support system even though they told me never to work in music um Mm. you know I'm I'm a benefactor from that, right? Like I'm one of those I'm one of those people. Um, and it's it's not about always about money. It's just like we talked about. It's about time, mm-hmm. right? Like I had the I had the I I went and studied sound engineering, which was you know I was listening to a podcast today about how you know like art art is is not a service that's needed right for survival. And it's mm-hmm. like, you know, a few people I know always, you know, it's, it's, it's an argumentative point, right? Because of mental well being and faith and all those things. But as in, if in like a um, political, you know, conversation or whatever that is economics, it doesn't contribute in the same way that for survival, that like making clothes or food or growing plants does in, a, in, in like a tangible way. It's, a, it's, it's esoteric, right? Like it's, um, so, you know, I didn't have this looming thing of when you're 19, you need to go and live on your own because we can't afford to have you in the house. Right. Right. Like, and some, not most people in the world do. And, and that is, you know, that is what it is. <laughs> that is what yeah. it is. That's why the industry is made up of what it is mainly like the higher, but I think, I think there are like positive signs of like that technology has done, but you know, it hasn't democratized creativity like people love to say it's not Mm. it's not a meritocracy people always say that it's just definitely not a meritocracy um but the tools are are easier to get to there's just more noise to get through exactly basic tools are easier and cheaper um yeah yeah Yeah, and in a way i think it's sorry go for it what you say no i I was I, i was just gonna say that you know the in the do think that you know the democratize yeah it is what it is what you said the democratize access is to tools is important um but that has created an influx of content that that then comes there have been issues with that given the platforms that you know in which that you know that content actually flows and the different financial incentives that that uh those platforms have for that content to flow and yeah. um you know the competing the the uh, competing incentive structures that those platforms have for their bottom line which doesn't actually you know overall it you know, doesn't really advantage the people who actually have democratized access to these new tools you know really as much as you think well yeah the, the the end product doesn't do what you would hope that would do right because there's all these other factors 
in, involved and you know the people that have the advantage still have infinite advantages it doesn't right. doesn't change that <laughs> um right. but yeah it, it, like i i work on some courses you know like i go and speak to like 18 20 year olds about making music and it's really dawned on me how lucky i was right like it sounds really hard right but the the fact that i had to work for three months to buy a sampler and an mpc and save up and like sleep on couches and eat baked beans and save every penny I can to buy that thing it seems terrible but but actually looking back on it it was it was very singular right to be to make beats like the people that I listen to non-stop all day every day I had to get an MPC that was the only way it was very linear right like get the MPC when I got the MPC the only way to use it was to listen and read the manual that's it Right? Like I could, I could ask my mate's brother, but he uses the S3000. I didn't know anyone that used an MPC. And me and my friend, we just sat down with a manual and, you know, diller. <laughs> and <laughs> just spent all day, every day working this thing out until it sounded right. And it, that sounds terrible to some people, but actually the, the YouTube tutorial thing is very overwhelming and it's very homogenizing, you know, like, yeah, I remember like telling people that we had an MPC and we had like um, a Commodore 64, <laughs> like an Amiga or something, and we were recording guitars over beats. And people were like, what? Like you're tracking, you know, like combining what was like rock and roll to us or like indie, the, the music, like which to us was like Radiohead or Massive Attack or things mm -hmm. like that, where that's just a given now. But even then, well, that was a differentiator for us. We played guitars and made beats, and that wasn't a thing that everyone was doing because it was quite technically complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, yeah, when I step into rooms sometimes, I, I have, I've learned to see how overwhelming it is now for people. I mean, it is for me, it's for all of us, right? Like there's just so much information. There is. Um... Yeah, I mean, you you get you know into like the paradox of choice, where there are you know there's not one YouTube video where you can go to to understand you know how to use a tool. There are mm -hmm. three thousand different ones, and all of these people saying that right. they they are the ones who truly know how to use this thing. And really, I mean, probably all of them like know well enough you know to help teach you. But but you have you know you have that amount of choice each step of the way. Like which product do I buy? Mm. How do I use the product? Um, what do I do with the product? You know, how do I lean into this? I remember, you know, there's an anecdote of, you know, of like when Barack Obama was in office, like he wore a gray t-shirt every, like that's what he wore every day. And, mm. and, and he did so just to remove one choice, you know, from his day, you know, given the amount of choice. You know the amount of choices that he would have to make and the understanding that like you know having this much choice as much as we'd like to you know convince ourselves that having choice really makes us happy is you know is overwhelming and and uses a lot of brain power that could be better spent on doing the thing <laughs> you know right yeah yeah and 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 also but coming from that background equips you different right like there's a lot I've got like a lot, lot less anxiety and panic about new technology, I think, than a lot of younger people that I work with. Um, because I've just worked it out my whole life, right? Like without without sort of having my hand held. Yeah. Um, I, you know, like I started out making beats on, um, like I said, a, you know, an MPC and then like an S3000 and like a, and Cubase and Commodore 64 and then you know, early Max, and then, you know, with, with, with Cubase and then Logic, and then I worked in Reason for years, and then I worked in Logic again for a long time. And then I got really into Pro Tools and was using Pro Tools for a really long time. Because when I went to the States, everyone used Pro Tools. Now I use Ableton. And none of it, I don't think, you know, it's just so normal to like have to work it out. Um, that I think maybe that also, you know, really, you know, releases some anxiety from like the experience of of like how fast things are changing mm -hmm. which you think it would make you more panicky about it but i think it doesn't for me yeah yeah i guess if you have that trust that like you know i'm i'm gonna be able to figure this out you know and then you realize that like oh yeah this DAW ableton is like well you know okay it works pretty much the same as logic works pretty much the same as pro tools i mean there's different 
and you know they have different interfaces but ultimately like you add a track an instrument track and then you like do all of the same shit in order to you know manipulate the music that right. that, that you want to make uh i feel like a lot of the you know the kind of intentionality you know that you're talking about of like like having a thought in mind like you want to get an mpc you want to learn how to use an mpc that is the route and like mm -hmm. having that intention i feel like a lot of that has dissipated almost because of how much choice there is where you, you know you kind of have a loose idea of something and that and that you know kind of extends across everything uh you know in like a place like spotify like going to like, what am i going to listen to like i have to be very intentional and i have to decide what i'm going to listen to before i i even open my computer otherwise i'm just going to get in, you know pulled in and i'm just going to hit play on something um you know whereas like thinking about in the pre-streaming area or like i guess pre-digital you know pre-mp3 area pre-mp3 era of you know having cds and like having like being very intentional going through a case what am i going to listen to and listen to the whole thing and like you really get you know get a lot out of that experience right. um you know I think, you know i feel at least like a lot more than i think i often do when i you know consume content today it's a huge problem even for me like i'm an obsessive person about music but same you know so i my daughter's like put on some music I'm like shit. What? Yeah. Right. Like, and and um, the paradox of choice. You know, there's just this is the the area that we're in, right? Which I think is attracting me a lot at the moment to thinking. I th I think like thinking about like punk values and things, right? Like, and at the heart of that is making stuff for yourselves and for each other, and mm. going back to that because what what else is there, right? This there is the the competition, right? But I you know. I found myself watching something about some 15 year old YouTuber who cracked YouTube shorts and he's got, you know, billions of followers in three months and blah, blah, blah. And they were like, we're going to speak to him about his like system. And they like, they start explaining, he starts explaining his system. And I'm like, this is fucking boring. <laughs> right. Like he's essentially like, I watched YouTube shorts for three months and took notes. And whenever I found one that felt like had a viral formula, I would just copy that exact formula and just change the title of their video slightly, right? This is not like rocket science, right? It's just like yeah. data analytics or like, it's, that's not being a creative. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it is being a creative and it isn't, right? But it's not art. Mm -hmm. um, it is creative in the same way that solving any business problem is being creative, right? Like yeah. or learning from anything. How to just deconstructing how a chair is made to make a chair, you know, like <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a skill it's a skill but it definitely just made me think like if this is being lauded that's just very, it was very interesting to me it's like this i know there's lots of creatives watching that video to work out how to get their work into the world to do what they want to do mm -hmm. but that that young guy is not doing what you think he's doing <laughs> right he's gaming he's his his output is gaming a system He's not a musician that's gaming a system so that people find his music and so then he can go and be a musician, right? It's it's just a very interesting world. And and it just makes me think that I don't, you know, it's very overwhelming to think of anything other than retreating into communities at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. Which isn't a career. Retreating into like a niche community is not a career, but maybe at least it's like, um, maybe it's more real. You know maybe it has more value to you as an individual anyway yeah it feels healthier um and you know in the sense that career is you know like part of our holistic you know life um to retreat into community it is is definitely you know an ass like i feel like a qualitative improvement um that could have implication could have implications on 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 your career and your overall well-being um and I just have a sense that like the more and more people are, I, I mean, but this also might just be because, you know, I live in a bubble too. Um, you know, the more that people realize that these are the systems that we operate in, this is, you know, these are gamifiable. And some people use them, you know, you know, as you said, like some people like are learning you know, to do that, to expose people to their art. And that's mm -hmm. like, 
you know an important part in the process but still like is there like like should we have a system that an artist should have to learn how to gamify in order to get their art to people or I, you, art, know, you know my yeah. mindset is constantly changing on this right because there are very very talented people doing it in amazing ways right um it, i think like my focus has turned to like our siloing of our skill sets and like how we we just especially music because of the system and the industry and the way it's formed that this thing is being a creative and this thing is this thing for me is being a creative and this thing is being a musician and you could you know like as musicians we're inherently very creative people but a lot of musicians i speak to anyway that they have this kind of that this is the only thing that i can do this is the only thing for me and it's interesting me watch watching i guess it's a visual medium so maybe it's more natural but you know seeing people who do like collage art doing like really beautiful storytelling about people's lives and building like a you know like a animated version of the story of their neighbor's life into like this beautiful piece of content that's really emotionally engaging showcases their work in ways that a lot of musicians very find it very hard to do and, and i'm not in film right so that could be the same for lots of other directors and animators but but there's definitely um music people are like this is the only thing that i can be creative at and it's taking us a long time to like work out how to apply that creative thing to other tooling to other mediums without it feeling like i'm just doing that thing i hate this i'm doing it to make the music work mm -hmm. but i'm not really getting like an emotional value from those other things it's like a chore social media is a chore right that's the thing that we hear all the time like i have to do this terrible thing um and I, i'm constantly questioning myself right like music just doesn't have the same value as it does to people did to people right so we, we come out of a world where like being a musician at least like in our minds was this like thing that everybody wanted to pay for and we're moving out of that now and yeah like i'm trying to encourage myself to try and work out like what is it about being good at music that what are those skills? What are those things? And and trying my best to put them into other places. And maybe as like a producer, that's kind of easier because you're constantly like working with artists to find like a canvas, you know, a direction, um, uh, you know, like how to communicate their identity through sound and processing and recording and the environment you create in the room to get the best out of a person. Um, but they're like skills that are very, you know project management right like we're developing artists we're, we're, we're doing budgeting campaigns uploading a data analysis you know like we're looking at other videos we're looking at what works well we're looking at what kind you know like there's so many skill sets but it's very hard to make a musician really see that and it's even harder to find a vehicle for them to demonstrate those skills are useful in other places um, all right which is something that's really interesting to me the more i work with like young people right which is like you're clearly incredibly talented but they're just like the world doesn't understand me you know like this is the <laughs> only thing i could ever do if i can't do this i don't want to do it i remember saying like i used to smoke a lot of weed right like i remember being like i don't care if i die when i'm 70 because mm. like i don't want to get old like you know mm. like the, shit, the kind of stuff you you know you say and think when you're like 16 17 18 19, older right it was mm -hmm. just that, like this is the life that i'm living for and the only life that i'm living for this thing mm -hmm. in my head mm -hmm. um and that's not useful <laughs> and it's potentially quite dangerous and damaging especially when it doesn't go the way that you expect it to yeah i feel like that's you know that's maybe why a lot of young people you know a lot of young people die I, you know a lot of young talented you know very creative people um you know who live hard and fast and and you know, there's also sort of a punk mentality of like, you know, you've like more nihilist. I think when you're a teenager because you have less understanding and like saying, I'll, you know, the, you know, I don't mind dying by seventy. But when you're, you, you know, when you're a teenager, that still feels like three lifetimes away. You know, right? So it does. Like yeah, I, I went. So I remember going to like a meeting with a big production company once when I was like, I don't know, maybe like my mid twenties or something um who wanted to manage me and my friend and the first question the person asked was like where do you see yourself in 10 years which like totally caught me off guard 
you know, it's easy to be like, yeah, number one producer, right? Like <laughs> making hits, making hits in America. But it definitely like, I think if I was being, if I'm being honest, I probably at that time thought that that was going to be this, what happened in two years. Mm-hmm. That's why it caught me off guard. Because I was like, 10 years? Yeah, what happens after I'm a millionaire? Um, but it's just, you don't, maybe, and maybe you shouldn't think like that, right? Because, you know, you, the whole, the, that's the beauty of like, phases of your life where you're not thinking ahead you're in the moment um yeah. and there's a push and pull of that right like there's a beauty in that and there's like an artistic output out of that that is clearly a thing um sure. but yeah you have a bit more space to think you know or more challenges thrown at you as you kind of push your way through an industry and that makes you think about your things more i guess yeah Indeed. Uh, as they say, ignorance is bliss. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wonder if like, technology allows us to keep the dream alive longer too, right? Because mm. if you're in the 70s and you have to get a job and start a family, you basically just can't be in a band, right? Because it takes touring, constant touring and constant gigging, right? Which is one of the hardest things to do alongside other challenges in life is being in a physical band is one of the hardest things to do. But being like an artist now from your home on a laptop that um that's the that's the data that's the data curse right is it constantly feels one step away because you know you everyone is telling themselves that it's not their fault it's the algorithm mm. right and it's just that it's, it's like a friend of mine um has just you know two friends of mine have just done a piece of research which um relates musicianship to gambling which came out of something that i said to him which was that it's like gambling right you it's like being on i described it as being on tilt right mm. so like when you're chasing in the casino you're chasing getting your money back it's like you're chasing getting your life back like you can't give up because of the shame of giving up to yourself inside yourself but you can't give up because it's, it could always it could happen tomorrow right it's not my fault you know like it's just the system and and it's true it's probably not most people's fault right <laughs> there's a lot of factors but you know, you're only one day away from hitting the algorithm, yeah. Um, or getting a viral post, or maybe you just need to post every day, or maybe you just need to post four times a day, or maybe you need to do five second clips to ten second clips, or maybe you need to do ten minute clips instead of two second clips, right? Or maybe you need to post on all the platforms. Oh wait, maybe you need to post on one of the platforms, <laughs> yeah. one platform, right? It's yeah. it's a, it's a really it's a really fragile and challenging space to mentally be in right now for create for people who who want to create careers. I shouldn't just keep saying creators, but people who want to create careers in this yeah. fucking mess that we're this mess that is like the, the internet, right? It's become. Yeah. That that's I mean, that's the type of uncertainty that, you know, fuels the success, you know, of these huge platforms. Is uh and, and that's why you have people like the Surgeon General in the US, you know, now advising that uh we put uh you know like parental restrictions you know on social media as something that that is unhealthy and treating it as um in you know akin to something like smoking cigarettes you know because it is you know it has such a profound you know you know prop, has such a profound impact you know, on mental health and i mean there are some states in the us that are you know talking about banning social media for in in you know entirely for minors which is you know, kind of crazy thinking about how often it's used and and you know how pervasive it is, but also makes you know makes a lot of sense, especially when you compare it. You know, do compare it to gambling. Like it is, it is a lot like that. It's an addiction. It is an addiction. There's no doubt about that, right? Like chasing the dream is an addiction, whatever, whatever field you're in. Um, and I think I do think like maybe music is more literal, but I guess any creative output has this extra thing of of um, it has this 100% has this extra thing that the product that you're selling has your identity embedded in it. So the reflection, the way the world reflects on your product is a reflection of you. That's mm-hmm. how it feels, right? Like it's a reflection on who you are as a human being um, as well. It's not just a reflection on your ability to, to, to make a product successful. Like if you're a VC or you may still put your heart and soul into the, making it work, right? Any business. But there's something very different emotionally and psychologically, the added dimension of like the work being a representation of like your soul, right? Like of you bearing your soul even. 
that is yeah really messy it's tough <laughs> yeah. um speaking of bearing your soul and music you know mm -hmm. that music that moves us uh you know i would love to to transition into part two where i ask you a bit you know a few questions about your music listening um you know a bit more and you know i want to start by asking how you know how you discover music um and if you could answer that question through you know perhaps by mentioning some of your preferred curators or outlets or you know the platforms that you spend time with um that is like a classically hard problem at the moment right like i think i i spend a lot of time on twitter and other social platforms and i have certain people that i will like go to who you know like have more time uh or maybe are more into discovery but you know my girlfriend introduced me to a lot of music you know when i when we met she was very much into like digging on soundcloud hmm. she's into quite like wonky left music um like me I discover a lot of music through people, I think, is, is like the easiest answer. I still discover music through the algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, I still. Um, but, yeah, I think people is probably the best answer, right? Which is, there's people I follow, there's people I chat to, there's people I see sharing things. Um, and I don't spend enough time digging anymore is the honest answer. You know, that's inevitably what happens is, like, you just have less time we're back to time. Yeah. yeah we're back to time you have less time but people is the answer you know like there's a nick cam smith who is, runs a platform called with fam is an amazing curator and i discover new stuff from him all the time i listen to benji b's show like the only thing like linear that i listen to and i've got way back into it more on on, on bbc6 music probably the best place to discover the kind of music that i like hmm. which is music that is interesting to me um you know a mix of different genres mm -hmm. um there's a few playlists that i go to like I, I still like artist playlists like no such thing quartet people like that have their own playlists on spotify which i still check out there is a couple of blogs that i like um still you know there's one called um stereo fox which i quite like that i turn to there's one called acid stag that i go to um you know, I still go to some of the, the general places, um, but, you know, between that and the algorithm and my friends, I, I still get a lot of, I'm in chat groups, right? We think we've talked about this a lot. So, like, I'm in my own chat group that I have for my, my friends, community, listeners, fans, whatever, you know, like whoever wants to join that people share music in. And I'm in other chat groups around other music artists that have, like, a feel. Um, and I just go with music through those as well. Um, so yeah, I guess everything you discover on the internet technically comes through <laughs> yeah. the algorithm, right? <laughs> I, I, the yeah. other thing is other artists, right? The classic thing of like artists sharing artists hmm. um, through socials, I guess. Cool. Um, okay, next question. What is the first album you ever purchased, if you can remember? And then what is the most recent? You know... The purchasing thing is always like a challenge for me because my dad got free CDs, oh, right? Okay. So like yeah. it got fed, it kind of like got fed down to me. Yeah. Uh, I, I can remember going to buy, I can remember going to buy like a Verve single, hmm. which I hadn't actually thought about until you asked me that question. Uh, I think my answer is normally without, yeah, without saying that I got, I remember getting like, I remember Doggy Style being like the first CD that I like pestered my dad to get me. <laughs> and just like the first time I'd ever really asked him and he would just, you know, like, I mean, my dad loves music, so he knew what it was. And he would, and, and you know, but I remember pestering to get that and Cypress Hill. Um, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Insane. yeah. I think they were my first ones. I think like the, the trashiest, earliest trashy memory I have is like wanting, um, Informer by Snow, which is like, oh yeah, <laughs> it's not, it's not, that's not a good one to throw out there, but that's an honest one. Yeah, mm. yeah. Cool. And then, do you know the most recent? Oh, the 
most recent that I bought. Um, well, I, I collect a lot of music, like especially like on um, on chain music. You know, like I buy stuff on Zora and Super Collector and um, places like that. Um, probably more than anywhere else. My DJ, so like I buy a lot of music. I think the last, the actual last time I pressed the purchase button was actually for um, the new, one of the new Mustafa singles uh, called Gaza Calling, which I think was the last thing I pressed purchase on, which I did through iTunes. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I know. But I needed an audio file. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, who, who are three artists of note that you've heard for the first time in the past year or so? Oh, wow um oh wow in the last year I, I think i have to do that thing where i turn to my spotify that's okay most people do um i discovered this kid well i met him actually at a gig and then i went home and checked out his music and was like holy shit this is fucking brilliant um i don't, i think you call it i think you pronounce it escher it's es dot c h e r and he's a guitarist that plays mm -hmm. on quite a lot of like grime and hip-hop records in the uk but he does this kind of like indie emotional like electronic dance music stuff that is very hard to pin down but is like brilliant mm. um really brilliant i don't know if i discovered it this year but i, I really like all the new vegan stuff it's spelled V-E-G-Y-N. He's like an electronic music producer. Okay. I listen to, yeah, I really like his style and production. Um, that's two. We said three, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, what's three? You know, like, I've got this playlist. I have this, like, endless, one of these endless playlists that um, I have this kind of thing where I will just add to it, no thoughts. It's like my rule. Right, it's mm. like no overthinking, no curation. I just throw stuff on there. So I'm gonna just have a quick look at that. And it ranges from like old stuff to new stuff. Okay, there's like, I don't even know how to pronounce it, but there's an electronic music producer. Oh, I should say, no, actually, I should say Mukji really, because I have been really obsessed with the Mukji album. Mm. Um, and even though I kind of heard his earlier work, you know, like um, how many miles and are you looking up? Someone sent me, are you looking up? when he first posted it doing um there's like a live version on youtube with him hanging out of the tour van and it's like really weirdly filtered because they tried to cut off the wind noise mm. um and i listened to i've actually recorded it off youtube because i listened to that more than the original oh wow that's cool. and i did get really obsessed with that right you know like what you were saying i don't know what to put on mm -hmm. i'm like an out i really still like i'm an album person if someone makes like a body of work I'm just like, I feel like listening to Mick G today all the time. I was just listening to that album all the time. And I love that thing where like, I still love that thing where other songs grow on you and no one cares about albums, right? I think it's just me. Um, mm. And I, I, some people do, but you know what I mean? But like, I love that, right? Like I listened to that album and there were songs that I think a younger me would skip, but like they connect with you in a different way at different times. Totally. And all of a sudden you're listening to like track 13 on repeat mm. right which you didn't at first you know and i think that's why you know like i love i love that record you know like I, I definitely remember like albums more than i do anything else and you know like i'll get into like a new james blake track or something but it will it will never stick like someone who's made an album i love mm -hmm. um and that always sticks with me way more. It just has this kind of like deeper journey for me. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I've been revisiting some, you know, some albums that I that I grew up listening to or listened to when I was a teen or and I mean that, you know, has been incredibly satisfying, you know, and exciting to revisit kind of the nostalgia factor, but also to see which tracks, you know, really speak to me now because you know, they're mostly yeah, entirely different than the ones that spoke to me then, you know, mm -hmm. which is good. I mean, that means, you know, we've changed, <laughs> which we should. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The course of our lives. Um, okay, here's the big question. You're going to a, a deserted island. 
Mm -hmm. and you get to bring three albums with you what are they this is always like one of those questions where the question always like it's like a mind trick right of like do you say like the, the greatest stars ever or do you say what album you could listen to for the longest yeah right um i always kind of have like in my mind i think like when you when you think of desert island discs my kind of like complex mind goes to like what would get the lead what would have the most to discover in it mm. like over that time do you know what i mean rather than necessarily what is this one album that i could just listen to forever and ever because like um what's got the most like layers um to it um which doesn't help me answer the question but <laughs> i i um I have like certain albums that have just like really like stayed with me, I guess, or like maybe like carved a path for me, like in terms of fitting in. I I was thinking about it. I don't listen to it that much, but I, I'm just going to say like the the Nirvana Unplugged record, the MTV one. I I could still go, but even though like half the songs aren't Nirvana songs, you know, like there's something about that record that never sounds boring to me um it always strikes a chord maybe it's the rawness of the emotion mm -hmm. um you don't want an album in the mix that's got a dud track do you you don't want you don't want an album in the mix that's got a dud track if you're gonna listen to it over and over again um maybe oh maybe like um Nostalgia Ultra, Frank Ocean, like the mixtape that came before um, Channel Orange, just because that's got like some, that was again like a seminal moment that stays with me, that record. Ah, oh, the last one, who's it going to be? I don't know. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to say. There's albums that come to my mind that like were seminal albums to me, like I'm a big fan of, um, I really loved like the Talking Book, Stevie Wonder album. Mm -hmm. Um, I could toss a coin between that and like Jimi Hendrix Little Wing or um, Beggar's Banquet by the Rolling Stones or, mm. um, you know, like maybe something from that era um, to balance out, to balance out some of the newer stuff. I, I don't know how to choose one of those. But let's say, let's say Talking Book by Stevie Wonder because that was like okay. an important discovery for me as a teenager. Cool. All right. That's a good trio, I think. Yeah. Um, and that's that's pretty much it. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, well, before you. before you know we part ways, you know, for folks who are listening who want to check out your your work, your music, your thoughts, where's a good place for them to do that? I'm I'm everywhere, right? But um, yeah. like we all are. Um, but if you do, if you put in Sound of Fractures, it's a long name. There's not many. There's not many of us. There's only one. Um, <laughs> On Twitter, you know, is where I like to talk in writing. On TikTok is where I like to talk to the camera. On Instagram is where, you know, mostly I post about music. Um, and in any of those places, there will be a link to a project called Scenes, which is what I've been working on. And I think that probably says the best, the most about me, which is that like, you know, I'm trying to bring people into my world a bit and create some stuff that has meaning to the audience whoever the audience is whoever discovers what i'm doing so um yeah come and find me come and find the scenes project um and work out what it is and yeah you get to kind of just like it's about the emotional value of music so if you love music and think it really matters and it really matters to you in your life and, and come check it out um and you can kind of come and take part in the project it takes a couple of minutes um and listen to a piece of music and get a little memento of a memory in return and if that interests you and you don't know what i'm talking about come and find out hmm. yeah do do as someone you know who did that and has spent some time with scenes it is a really beautiful project it's you know really connective and really important reminder of of the emotional context you know that music has and why we should you know why we should value it it's a representation um, of everything we talked about today, right? Like yeah. that's what it's, that's what it is. It's like I, you know, it's become this thing of like, how do I pull people out of this social media loop? How do I have that active conversation of why you should care about music and why it matters? And it's also me focusing on a really small niche thing of like trying to find these 
people that want more instead of mm -hmm. trying to shout out into the screaming void of a billion zillion people that like all different things yeah um so in a way yeah it, it kind of sums up an experiment that kind of sums up all the things we talked about today in a way indeed indeed um and now that you've been through the ringer who is another music head that we should have on for the record oh i mean i i have had like a few people in my life over the last couple of years that have been really impactful in my career um or my journey i should say rather than my career one is um a collector called cy i think he would describe himself as a collector but clearly he's much more than that um but as someone who has like a really strong thesis on like you know supporting music and and building music infrastructure for musicians and exploring different ways has been really impactful um to me again nick cam smith would be a great guest who's building with fam he is a really intense music lover you know like a digger really um always introducing me to new music martin warraven who we know well also someone who's always pushing my thinking on, on like artist careers and creative industries um they're the three that come to my mind they're very much in like my circle of you know someone else who I, I really like is elijah who is like a um i don't know what you would say he is now a founder a um a talker an educator he came from the grime scene in the uk has this thing that blew up called yellow squares it's just you know hmm. great person to follow great person to talk to um a great conversation starter about everything in music so yeah cool Awesome. Uh, well, that's all we got, Jamie. You know, thank you again. Uh, you know, for your time and thoughts. It's great. You know, to connect as always. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it was great. Really enjoyed it. Absolutely. I mean, take care. Cool, man. Bye, bye. Thanks everyone for being here. That's a wrap on another episode of For the Record, a conversation series with all manner of music heads about their stories and the music that makes them. It's a production of Graymat and a new Crate Coalition experiment in building connective listening graphs. We stamp every music mention you heard here from musicians to venue owners, to journalists, to tech builders, to DJs. And in the background, we're mapping these names to form those yet unseen connective threads between them. Want to get involved? You can check out our website at graymatter.fm or come hang out in the Crate Coalition Discord. See you next time.